Uh, well, time for another video, I guess. Uh, one problem, this time I've got nobody to talk to. Uh, well, a bit awkward. Never mind, I'll just have to talk to myself. He means me. <laughs> get it? Because, uh, talking to myself and he's me and they, they, they get it. They, they, well, they get it. Yeah, I know. It's just because talking... It, it was funny, okay? It was funny. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. Today we are talking about antimatter and how it can be used as fuel. That's great, but what actually is antimatter? Well, as the name suggests, antimatter is the opposite of matter, basically a substance made up of antiparticles. That's fine, but what's an antiparticle? Well, again, as the name suggests, it is the opposite of a particle. They have the same mass as normal particles, but opposite charges. So still, for example, an anti-electron, a positron, and an anti-proton can co come together to form anti-hydrogen. So if it has the prefix anti, it's probably made up of antiparticles. Exactly. So when did we find out about antiparticles? Well, they were first discussed by William Hickson in the 1880s when he was discussing negative gravity but the term was first used by Arthur Schuster in 1898. The modern theory of antiparticles only came around in 1928 by Paul Dirac, and the complete periodic table of antimatter was created by Charles Genet in 1929. On a unrelated note, the Feynman Stuckelberg interpretation is the interpretation that antimatter is just normal matter but traveling through time. For example, that a positron is an electron simply moving backwards in time. Wait, 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 going back in time, you said that was impossible, right? Right? Okay, okay, okay. This is just simply an interpretation used to simplify complex diagrams and should be used to discredit other well-made videos. Well, with that out of the way, we can focus on why we're here. How can we use antimatter as a fuel? Well, to do that, we need to use a technique called annihilation. Sounds fun? That's what I thought. Annihilation is the process of a subatomic particle coming into contact with its respective antiparticle, resulting them in being... Annihilated? Thanks. Yes, for example, a positron colliding with an electron. The energy and momentum are conserved, but the particles are replaced by photons. But how can this be used for fuel? Well, when an electron and a positron collide, it forms two photons of gamma radiation. Gamma radiation, which has energy. Clever, but what about when a proton collides with an antiproton? The same thing? Not so glad you asked, George. This is a bit more complicated. Very simply, they release much more energy than the low levels that electron annihilation does. But the amount of an energy released is so great that humans are aiming to use them to power spaceships in the future. In the future, so they're none at the moment yet. Unless you count the Starship Enterprise, which is powered by some atomic annihilation, then no. Why not? Well, for that level of power, you would need a more complex atomic nucleus. And the more complex the nucleus, the more unstable it is. And if the antimatter goes wrong, then what? Well, only two kilos of antimatter has the destructive potential of 86 megatons, which is more powerful than any H-bomb exploded to death. Oh, yes, it does demonstrate how if antimatter did go wrong, the results would be catastrophic. Not to mention that it can only be formed in particle accelerators and in some forms of radioactive decay. So, as in what's becoming a sort of theme in these videos, it is possible, just not practical. Eh? Maybe one day you'll make a video about something that actually works. Shut up. 